Again, our Father, we come to you today thanking you for the many blessings. Father, we thank you for all that has been done today for your honor and your glory. We thank you for the lessons that were taught in Sunday school. Father, we thank you for the joy that is ours in fellowship. And Father God, we thank you for your presence here. For you've told us we're two or more gathered in your name, uh, that your Holy Spirit would be in our presence. We ask, Father God, that uh, your Holy Spirit would have free reign to teach us today, that he would have free reign to speak into each and every heart, and that everything said and done, Father, would be magnified through his ministry in each and every life. Be with us, Father, as we open your word and speak your word, that our hearts should be filled to overflowing, and that we, like the psalmist, could be able to say, Father, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. As we are going verse by verse and chapter by chapter. You know, this is a long book. We, you know, if Jesus doesn't come back, we might be here for quite some time. You know, 50 chapters in Genesis, and I'm only going to go through six verses today. But these six verses are so full of good things that we're going to have to, to go as slow as we can. You know, my pastor used to preach maybe one verse at a time if you were lucky. And we'd be in the book of Ephesians for three or four years sometimes. So, you know, you've got the, you've got the guy who runs the sprints here today, <laughs> according to him. But, you know, God is good. And God tells us all about himself in his word. His Bible is true. We've seen it from over and over and from time immortal. People have challenged it. People have questioned it. People have even tried to do away with it. My favorite story in that is Voltaire, the great uh, skeptic philosopher of France who decided that during the, the great time of the Enlightenment that he would make the statement that there would be no more Christianity in 100 years and that the, all the reason of man would outthink all of this stuff. But the bottom line was that his, after his death, his home was purchased and Bibles were printed in his home. I thought that was rather unique that the Bible Society of France would print Bibles in his home. But anyway, we still have the Bible. It is still here. It is still God's word. It still refreshes our heart. It still challenges each and every one of us. And today is one of those challenges, folks. Abram was a man of faith, but he was also a man. Faith is an interesting thing, folks. Each and every individual, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but each and every individual ever born on the face of the earth, God places within that spark of life a measure of faith. Every one of you here had faith. When you came in, you sat down in a pew. You thought this pew will hold me. You didn't even think about, you know, what's going to be the problem here. You got, in, got up this morning. You went to bed last night thinking, I'll go to church in the morning. You exercise faith. We all do. We exercise faith in many areas of our life. We exercise faith that you're going to have a job next week, or this week, I should say. But the bottom line is we exercise faith. We don't always see it as that. But many of us use faith each and every day. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and verse 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, I like the way the NIV puts it. The NIV puts it this way. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Being sure of what we hope for. And then the rest of the verse says, the evidence of things not seen. Again, the NIV says it this way. And certain of what we do not see. Many of you have probably traveled all over the world. Many of you know some of the cities I might name to you. Perhaps you've never been to this city. But I'll name a city, for example, have you, you know, a lot of people have been to London. And so if I would say, I believe that London exists, you would say, well, I do too, because I've been there. But many people have not, but yet they believe it exists. And so we could name all manner of cities, all manner of towns all over the world. For example, I could tell you of a city that's named Leopold, Indiana. And have you ever been to Leopold, Indiana? Raise your hand. Two of us. Well, that's because, and it's a true city. I've been there. My wife has been there. I'm telling you, it's true. My relatives founded it back in the early 1800s when they came from Belgium. Okay? They formed it, Leopold, Indiana. 
and that and about uh, 50 cents will get you a cup of coffee in their little diner in town. But the bottom line is not everybody knows of Leopold, Indiana, so they might say, I don't believe you. But you see, you have to take it by faith in that aspect that it exists. Faith is not a blind leap into the darkness, but rather it is a total trust in God and upon his word. It is not a blind leap into the darkness. Abram was a man of faith. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 8, the Bible says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called. In verse 9 of that chapter, it says, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise. In verse 17 of that chapter, it says, By faith Abram, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Abram was a man of faith. I think we can take that at face value. The word of God tells us that Abram was a man of faith. The Bible says very simply that Abraham walked in faith. But you know, Abraham was a human being. He was not some superhero. He was not some Marvel character that we make movies over. But rather, Abraham was a man just like you and just like me who had questions, who had doubts, who had fears, but rather yet trusted in God. And that's what it's all about today. We're going to talk about Abraham's promise of an heir. Now, in that in itself sounds great. Well, so what's the big deal except the fact that Abram had no children? Abram, who would later become Abraham, <clears throat> was a very wealthy man, had great, great amounts of wealth, but he had no heir, had no sons, no daughters. He himself and his wife were barren. Abram was this man of faith. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians about faith. And here's what he wrote in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, by for we walk by faith and not by sight. Christian God has said that we walk by faith. And so therefore, not only can we be men and women of faith by knowing that there are people in the Bible who are men and women of faith, but we can walk daily <clears throat> excuse me, in faith because Paul challenges us, as he challenged the Corinthians, to walk in faith. In our text today, we're going to see another opportunity for Abram. It's an opportunity for Abram to exercise his faith, not in something unbelievable, not in something bizarre or out of, out of touch, but rather to exercise his faith in God. And I want you to believe as Christians to understand that God is not calling you to be a mind-numbed idiot who just believes whatever he's told or she is told. God is not asking us. That is not faith whatsoever. But rather, faith is a belief in God and his word. Like Abraham, we can walk in faith. Faith is not a belief in spite of the evidence to the contrary. But rather, faith is a belief in God and his word. I want to establish that first and foremost because we're going to go into some very interesting things that matter of, we're going to speak of the matter of faith and we're going to speak of the matter of human reasoning. Let's start with verse 1 in chapter 15. And these things, excuse me, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. We see here in just these six short verses one of the most fascinating studies of faith. One of the most unique studies of faith. Abram is a man of faith. He's the father of faith. 
He is the first individual that literally we can identify as one who walked in faith. The first thing I want you to see is the word of God's promise. God gave a promise to Abram. He said, I'm going to give you an heir. Now, Abram tried to logically conclude what that was. Perhaps it was going to be Lot, but Lot did not work out, did he? Lot went his own way. Lot decided to go off and do his thing. Lot decided to be in love with the world and the things of the world. And so, therefore, he disqualified himself as Abram's heir. And so Abram says, okay, who's the closest friend to me? My servants are in this land. My my family is in this land with me. And one in my own family is born into this family. And Eleazar from Damascus will be my heir. So he thought it out logically. He concluded, this man will be my heir. We see, first of all, in verse 1, God's marvelous pledge. God had told Abram, I'm going to give you an heir. And Abram had thought it out logically, whom that could be. But we see here in verse 1, a timely word of promise. After these things, what things? Well, if you know the chapter before, as you remember last week, Abram was in a great battle. Abram was in a lot of battle here. And the bottom line was that God was telling him or reminding him of his previous experiences. After these things, the writer Moses is sharing with us that God chooses this time to share with Abram. Many times God reminds us of our past experiences so that we might understand what he is expecting of us through faith. Sometimes God will remind us of those times that God was with us and that God carried us through difficulties, that God carried us sometimes through the good times. You know, sometimes it is the the times of plenty and the times of prosperity is more dangerous than the times of attack. But anyway, God is going to use this time of previous experience to remind Abram that he protected him through the battle. And let me say this to you, beloved. All of us, each and every one of us have battle stories. There's not an individual here today that cannot say that I've gone through some tough times. We all have. That's one of the things in common we share. We've gone through some tough times. I don't know what that is, and God certainly does, and God was with you, and he did carry you through the tough times. You wouldn't be here if if he hadn't. There are many times that we can look back and say, God took care of me. But folks, that's not faith. Faith is looking forward in uh, what I don't see. And what I'm not, but certainly what I am sure of. We see God protected Abram through battle, through his previous experiences. Also in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. We see also God is sharing with Abram his personal encounters. God has always protected Abram. That doesn't say that Abram didn't have tough times. Abram had some pretty tough times. Folks, sometimes we we open the door to the wrong house. Sometimes we open the door to the wrong buildings. Sometimes we go down the wrong street or down the wrong alleyway like the young prodigal son did, and God still protects us and wakes us up. Sometimes we're in the middle of the pig pen. God wants us to know, folks, that through our personal encounters with him, he has always protected us always cared for us, always given us the way out. We can have faith in that. God speaks this time to Abram, not through a voice, which I believe Abram heard the voice of God. Many of the Old Testament uh, prophets, many of the Old Testament people heard literally the voice of God. This time, Abram is spoken to by a vision. Now, a vision, folks, is not something difficult to understand. A vision is something that happens beyond Abram's ability. It's not a dream. I've had some pretty crazy dreams before, haven't you? My worst nightmare, I'll give you an insight of what preacher nightmares are. Preacher nightmares are you come into 
a huge auditorium and it's filled with people and you're excited and you think, man, I can't wait to preach. And you open up your Bible, you have no notes and your Bible has plain pages. There's nothing written on it. There is no vision in that. You do understand. Vision is not a dream, so to speak. It's not, a, it's not something that we, because we ate that anchovy on that pizza the night before, we had a vision. But rather, it's an encounter with God in an otherworldly experience. Abram has no control over this. God is visiting him in a vision. We see in verse 1 also <clears throat> a tender word of preservation. God is going to speak to Abram because Abram has a problem that God is aware of. Look at verse 1 again. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. Obviously, Abram was afraid. Well, Pastor, that's logical. It states it that way. But you know, sometimes we gloss over that. Abram, the mighty Abram, the man of faith, the great man of, of Israel, the great father of all the Jewish peoples, he was afraid? Folks, why is it that we seem that everyone else can't be afraid but us? Why is it that we all have all these problems and think the whole world never has a problem and we're the only ones that have them? God is showing us here that this man of faith was afraid. What was he afraid of? Well, we see a word of assurance here, do we not? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Abram. You see, fear does not come from God, does it? So therefore, Abram was receiving fear from somewhere else. Could have been from his own inadequacies, his own feelings of, of emotional problems. Maybe Abram had a problem with Sarai that morning. Maybe he had a problem with some of the guys there at the work, and, and he just didn't feel good about himself, and he was afraid of the future yet ahead. Maybe he was looking at the stock market that day. You know, sheep one, sheep two, cow one, cow two. Boy, the cows aren't going up this year. And the sheep are going down this year. Maybe he was taking a look at listening to his stockbroker and saying, you know, i got a problem here. So maybe he was afraid. But see, God does not give us fear. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. So why do we fear? We fear because of a lack of faith. We fear because of a lack of faith. You see, we, we look at the wrong things sometimes. We look at the physical things. We look at the things around us. We look at the issues. We read the newspapers. We, we read the blogs. We get online, we look at all the things that are going on, and listen, folks, it is enough to drive you crazy, is it not? It's no wonder people are afraid today. People are afraid in Greece today. There are a lot of people who have no clue what's going to go up with their country. There are a lot of people even in our own country that are fearful today. But folks, it's a lack of faith. Now, that's not to say we won't go through troubled times. Daniel was taken captive and taken off to a foreign country. But yet, through faith, he understood that God was with him. We see here a timely word of tenderness, a word of reassurance. God says, do not be afraid. And I say the same thing to you. You may not know what's going to happen tomorrow. I was watching an interview on, on the Internet the other day about a, a lady of, I think it was Fox Business, that was interviewing Tim Tebow at a convention uh, of something, some of the things that he was representing. And she said to him, what, what's going to happen next season for you? And he says, I have no clue. He said, I don't know what my future holds for me, but I know who holds my future. And I thought, you know, that is timely advice for today, is it not? Some of you might be fearful about what's going on in your life. You might be fearful with your relationships. You might be fearful with your jobs. You might be fearful with the economy. You might be fearful of all those things. But the Bible says that we can have faith in all of this. God gave a wonderful word of reassurance. Do not be afraid, Abram. 
And then we see a word of revelation. I am your shield. Look at verse 15, verse 1, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. This is the first time the word shield is used in the Bible. And it's a very unique thing. A shield, if you remember, is a symbol of defense and protection. You used a shield in the old armor days back in the knights and all of that and, and some of the ancient warfare. You used a shield against someone else's weapon. And you did it to protect yourself. What did Paul say was the shield of the Christian? You remember? The shield of faith. So what is he saying here to Abram? Do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your faith. Put your faith in me. I am your defense. I am your protection. Again, this is the first time. And it goes throughout the entire Bible with the same resonant uh, uh, message. God is our defense. God is our protection. Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Oh, folks, listen, if your faith is in the stock market, you got a roller coaster ride coming. If your faith is in your job, you've got a roller coaster ride coming. If your faith is in your spouse or in your in your friends or in your family, you got a roller coaster ride coming. Oh, folks, I cannot tell you how many times I've been to the cemetery and families have said to me, we did not believe this could happen. We did not know this was going to happen. Folks, when death comes and when tragedy comes, if you don't have your faith in God, your world is going to be rocked, your world is going to be changed, your world is going to be devastated. And God was telling Abram, do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your faith. Put your faith in me. I am your defense. I am your strength. Then we see a word of reward in the verse 1. Boy, isn't this a good verse? Listen, folks, this is a wonderful verse. If you take the word of God and go through it extensively and wring it out like a washcloth, you will wring out a bucket load of blessing. Don't just read over the Bible. Don't just gloss over it and say, well, hey, it's nice prose. You read it and live it and drench it out, wring it out and find everything in it for you. Again, we see your exceedingly great reward here. He said, oh, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. God says, I'm the one to give you a reward, not your boss. Not your work, not your next door neighbor, not the government. None of these things. These are not the ones who are going to reward us. God is. We see God's pledge is simple here, is it not? God said that he would continue to fight for Abram. He said, Abram, I'm going to continue to fight for you. He would shield him in battle. And he would continue to reward Abram as necessary. Abram's refusal of the king of Sodom's uh, riches pleased God, did it not? Remember last week, he had two kings that met him after battle. The king of Salem, who blessed him with wine and bread, emblems of the, of the communion with Christ. And then we had the king of Sodom who showed up and he said, you can keep all the trinkets and all the riches, you just give me the people. We see Abram says, you keep all your trinkets. I don't want, I don't want anything from you to make to, for, so that you can say you made me rich. And God, God was absolutely pleased with that. Again, this threefold promise is given to all believers that trust in God and rely upon his marvelous pledge. God is our blessing, is he not? He is our shield. He is our protection. He is our defense. And he is our great reward. Look at verses 2 through 4. We see God's miraculous provision. God has a miraculous provision for Abram. Look at the distress in Abram. He's got a problem here. <clears throat> Excuse me, in verse 2 and 3, he's got a problem. In verse 2, he, he has a pleading reverence. But Abram says, Lord God, 
what will you give me? Now, again, this is the first time that man has called out to God that is recorded in the Bible by using the word Lord. Now, Lord is in the Bible all throughout the Bible in the early parts of Genesis, but this is the first time someone has called out to God and said, Lord God. We see here that he addresses God as Lord, as his master, which is the proper way to approach God. God is our Lord and Savior, is he not? Now, the name here in the Hebrew is a very interesting name. It is the name that the Jewish people call that four-letter name. They will not pronounce this name. They will not even write it out. In fact, even in English, they write it G-D. They won't even write G-O-D because they know they're using the divine name of God, and they will not use it. In fact, the word here in the Hebrew is the word Hashim slash Elohim. And the reason why it's used two names of God is that, number one, it's using that name above all names, that name of Yahweh, or what we call Yehovah, or Jehovah. But it also includes the name Elohim, which basically, according to, to Abram, as he's speaking out to God, he is calling on the God of mercy and judgment. He is saying to this God, I know you have judgment, but I also understand you are a merciful God. God, I'm not perfect. You know why he's saying that? Because he remembers Egypt. When he went down in Egypt and he failed God completely and lied to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh gave him money and told him to get, get lost, get out of Egypt. So Abram knows about the judgment of God, but he also knows about the mercy of God. And so he calls upon the Lord, the Lord God, Hashim Elohim. And he approaches God that way for what? He has a personal reaction. Look at the second part of verse 2. Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? You see, that's a personal reaction. Many times, folks, we hold within ourselves some animosity or hard feelings. Sometimes those are directed at God. Oh God, if my child hadn't died. Oh God, if, if I hadn't lost my job. Oh God, if that deacon hadn't been such an idiot. Oh God, if that preacher hadn't been so mean. Oh God, if all these things didn't happen, I would have faith in you. Sometimes we reproach, approach God from a personal reaction rather than a personal response. I'm childless. Maybe you didn't notice that. Maybe God, when you were out somewhere in the far-flung universe creating all the planets and doing all this stuff to confuse all the evolutionists, maybe you didn't note that I was childless. Now, folks, do you see just a little bit of anger here? Again, Abram isn't questioning God but rather he's reacting to God in human logic. He's using good human logic, is he not? The last part of verse 2 and the verse 3, we see his practical response. So he's going to answer it for God. The last part of verse 2 says, And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. God, I don't have any kids. How can you give me this blessing? How can you give me this riches? How can you give me this special blessing when you haven't so far? And oh, by the way, I'm getting older. <laughs> Do you know the rest of the story? He actually has a kid and he's 100 years old. I dreamed many, many years ago that my wife got pregnant. I thought I would choke her when I woke up. <laughs> Not to be rude. You, 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 it, was just a, it was just those feelings you get. And you, I thought, man, how in the world can I have a kid in my 50s? Imagine 100 years old. Hey, Dad, you want to go play basketball? Yeah, let me get my cane. The bottom line is, folks, Abram was worried, was he not? 
This is a God who's speaking to him strange things, and he's saying, wait a minute, I don't think you've really checked this out, God. You really haven't thought this out. Look at me. Do you notice that, again, Lot was no longer considered his heir? Again, Lot was backslidden and unqualified to be his heir. Abram had not even, not even considered him. Abram was confused at his best at this point. His faith was strong, but his facts were shaky. We must realize that God's promises are simply miraculous. We try to put God in a box, do we not? We try to define God by our experiences, by our logic. You know, there are people that say because God is pure and God is perfect and God is loving, then nothing can happen to me. Nothing can happen bad in the world. Nothing can happen at all. But yet we see there are bad things that happen in this world. Yet there are starving children in Africa. Yet there are people who murder each other, people who kill each other, and some do so in the name of Christ. How can this be? If God is real, how can this be? There is no logic in it. Well, the bottom line is we're using human logic, are we not? But you see, the divine logic is this. This is not the world that God created. This is a world that was inundated with sin. This is a world that fell. This is a world that fell apart from its original creation. This is a world that was so repulsive that at one point God had said in the life of Noah, I hate this world. And I'm going to destroy it all except those who will trust in me. And it was eight people. We see that God saw a world that he did not make. And so he came to redeem this world. He sent Jesus, his son, to die in this world. He let them have him. He let them murder him on the cross, so to speak. That we might have everlasting life. God certainly does not rejoice in the death of people. God certainly does not rejoice and the tragedies of children. God certainly does not rejoice, but there is a day coming. You see, God knows those little children are going to live forever. God knows that souls in the life of men will live forever and one day have to stand before God. The Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the Stalins and the Pol Pots and all these people throughout the years who have acted like monsters will one day stand before God and give an account of everything they did. There is justice in the world, folks. We see the distress of Abram. No heir. Verse 4, the declaration of assurance. <clears throat> the Bible says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come out from your own body shall be your heir. <clears throat> the given of God's promise, God says it's not going to be Ele e Eleazar. It's, it's a given. It's just not going to be. Sorry, Eleazar, but you're not the one. Abraham was going to be the father of the Jewish people and he was going to uh, have a, the family of his own. He's going to have his own son, his own son Isaac and Jacob. And from Jacob, he will go to all those others down through the lineage to the children of Israel. Also, there's the grace of God's promise. Did you see that in verse 4? Verse 4, the Bible says, This one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body. There is one coming, God's grace of promise. An heir of Abraham and Sarai, their son, is going to be a miracle. Again, beyond human logic. This isn't logical. I'm too old for this. Certainly it can't happen. But you see, faith is not faith in the logical sometimes. Then we see the guarantee of God's promise. Again, in verse 4, the Bible says, Your own body shall be your heir. He said, it's going to happen. It's a guarantee put on it. God's word is truth, and you can trust in it. You can trust in it. Well, it's not happened so far. They've been talking about Jesus coming back for 2,000 years. He's not back yet. Well, that's okay. I believe he's coming. Maybe today, might be tomorrow, might be next month, might be next year. I kind of hope it's soon. You see, faith is a trust in God and his word. It's not a leap into the dark. It's not putting my intelligence aside. 
It's not putting away my logic and say, hey, I'm just going to be stupid and just check in into, to the loony bin and say, hey, I want to believe in this, even though the facts say totally different. We see in verse 5 and 6 the witness of God's promise. God says, I'm going to give you a witness to this. Not only so the word of God's promise, but we see the witness of God's promise. Now, this is where it gets really fascinating. Look at verse 5. We see God's magnificent illustration. God says, I'm going to illustrate this for you. Abram, you're in a vision. Now, forget, don't forget, Abram is probably laying on his back somewhere in his tent. Okay? He's not walking around like you or I right now. But rather, he is in a vision. We see, first of all, the realm of human logic. In verse 5, the Bible says, And he brought him outside. You see, in verses 1 through 4, Abram has been dealing with everything that God has told him with human logic. Now, one, of my, one of my many areas of, of interest in my undergraduate work was philosophy. I, en I rather enjoyed it. I took a course one time, the philosophy of nothingness. I, it was rather unique. It was rather unique. And so when the professor gave us our little sheets at the end of the, of the, quarter, uh, the semester and said, what did you get out of this? I put nothing. <laughs> I thought he'd be happy with that. It was the philosophy of nothing. But he wasn't. But anyway. But the whole aspect of human logic is very unique. We human beings have an ability to logically think things out. If this doesn't work, let's try something different. Well, if that doesn't work, let's try something different. Now, if this works more than once, then we ought to do that more, than often, more often than we do the other. We can logically think things out, and that makes us different than the chimpanzees that stick a stick in a hole and pull out some ants and slurp it off. You see, the human logic is, I'm going to pay somebody else to do that. <laughs> the bottom line is, human logic was what Abram was using. But there's a problem with human logic. It's imperfect. You see, it's flawed. Sometimes human logic is flawed by sin, by our emotions, sometimes by our actions. It's because of our fallen nature. And sometimes our human logic is impeded. It's obstructed by sin, by others. It's because our world is sinful. That's why Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but to its end is the way of death. Looks right, smells right, acts right. Why is it all wrong? Because your premise is wrong. We see also in verse 5 the reality of heavenly logic. You see what's very unique, we see the testimony of God's word, the testimony of God's stars, or his works, excuse me, God's works, the testimony of God's stars. Note this, in verse again, 1 through 4, Abram is literally using human logic, and the Bible says God has to take him outside. Now, Here's Abram in a vision. He's going outside the tent. Oh, by the way, Paul says the tent was our body, our natural body. This old tent that we live in, Paul said on many occasions, the clay jar that we live in, this old tent that we live in. God is taking Abram out of his human nature, out of his human logic, and he says, I'm going to give you an illustration of my promises. And that illustration of my promises is outside of human logic. It's outside of human nature. And I want you to relate to godly heavenly logic. You know, that's what the Midrash, the Jewish text states, that God had to take Abram out of his human reasoning, out of his human nature, and show him the truth. God transcends both human nature and human logic. Again, it is not to set aside our intellect. It's not to set aside our reasoning. It's not to do those things. That's not what God is asking us to do. But what God is asking us to do, quit comparing apples and oranges. 
Quit trying to figure God out with human reasoning when in reality it is beyond human reasoning. How is it human reasoning that an old man that is 100 years old impregnates a woman 90 years old and is excited about it? How's that going to be great? How's that with human logic? But yet, physically speaking, it should be impossible. How did the water divide when the children of Israel walked through the water in the Red Sea? Did that really happen? Be, get rid of your human logic and think of it as God dealing with this, folks. Did God really part the sea? Why not? Is anything impossible for God? Is anything impossible that God can say, well, oh, gee, I wish I could do that. I've tried for many, 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 many thousands of years. Just can't get the hang of it yet. There is nothing impossible for God. If we look beyond the human nature, look beyond the human logic, go outside the tent and look at what God has created. Many people look at the stars and say it is a massive explosion. Yet many people say it's an intricate work, like much like clockwork that literally moves in fashion and form. There has to be some intelligent design in this. Because they move beyond the human logic. They move beyond the human nature and look beyond the little tent that we live in. Genesis chapter 114, and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. Yes, it tells us time. Yes, it talks about seasons, but it also says it's signs. Something's going on up there. Why is it functioning like this? Oh, well, we're going to Mars. Populate, there's a place in Amsterdam that's going to populate Mars. You know, when somebody asks them, isn't this rather stupid? It's a one-way trip. They say, oh, no, Magellan did it. You know, the... the when the people came to the new world, they did, and I agree. I'm happy. Let them all go. I, you know, I don't mind. I wouldn't mind going to Mars if I had a trip back. That'd be fine. You know, what are they going to find up there, folks? They're going to find some red dirt. They're going to find a lot of red dirt. And they're going to find out something unique. It all works in form and fashion, like a clock. And they're going to find nothing different than they already knew. But you see, if they go beyond the human logic of what they see, go beyond the nature of humanity, and look into the heavenly logic, they're going to find out there's something there. God placed those stars in the universe to show Abram and to show us his presence, to show us his power, and to show us his promises. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Why is it even the native in the farthest most flung uh, jungle and still understands by looking up, seeing the stars, there is a God. He may not know him as Jehovah. He might not know him as Jesus. But he knows him as God because he says, that star is there every time I look at this particular time, at this particular point of the year. There is a God in heaven. We see the testimony of the heavenly logic. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and, and uh, uh, temporary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And here's the point. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. What Paul is telling the Corinthians there, folks, is to look beyond the human logic, the human nature, and look upon God, who is all things. Look at verse 6, God's magnanimous inheritance. In verse 6, we see God saying to Abram, that you're going to have descendants. He says your descendants are going to be numbered like the stars. And look at verse 6. And he believed in the Lord. You see, that's Abram's complete trust. 
Again, the Jewish writers, the Jewish sages say here, this is where Abram is in total submission to God. This is when, when Abram surrenders to God and says, I'm not putting my, my intellect aside, God, but I believe you, I believe in you, and I believe your word. He believes in the inspiration of God's word because it is truly God's word. Abram believed because God promised him. And he believed in the infallibility of God's word. It was God's word. It was without error. God said this is the way it happened, and this is the way it was going to happen, and he believed it. It is his faith in God's word and in God himself. Again, faith is not a blind leap into the dark, but a total trust in God and his word. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If I come to God and say, okay, God, prove yourself to me. My favorite one is when the guy stands there and says, okay, God, if there is really a God in heaven, hit me with a bolt of lightning. You think what you're saying. You know, God, give me an apple. God, produce a mango fruit. God produce a pineapple, but not strike me with lightning. How logical is that? Okay. Okay, next. The bottom line is, folks, we can be illogical when it comes to the matter of God. If it doesn't fit in our little small compartment, if it doesn't fit in our little tubes that we've fashioned in our life, if it doesn't fit in every part of what we've thought is life, then God cannot exist. And so our human logic becomes illogical because we choose not to look upon God and see him in heavenly logic. You see, Abram's complete trust. Have faith in God. Have faith in his word. And finally, in verse 6, the Bible says, and he counted it to him for righteousness. God says, I took a counting of it. And you know what, Abram? You come out all right. You see, God's accounting of his faith was simple. God was judging Abram. He was testing Abram. He was wanting to see Abram's faith. And you see, God said, I saw your faith, Abram. When I took you outside of the logical, when I took you outside of the human reasoning, when I took you into my realm, I saw your faith in me. So what did he do with it? He trusted God. Romans 12, 3 says this, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I said earlier, each one of you, God has given a measure of faith. You can use it to believe in the ridiculous. You can use it to believe in, in the obscure. You can use it to believe in the absurd. Or you can use it to believe in the miraculous. You know, the Sadducees of Jesus' time really messed up because they could not believe in the miraculous. And so when Jesus was brought to them in the time of the, he was brought before the Sanhedrin, when he was proposed to be as God, they could not believe it because it could not happen in their mind. Couldn't be. And when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to 500 people at one given time, as well as the disciples, as well as the women, as well as to some of his own enemies, which was his brothers and sisters, who later became believers when they saw him, they could not believe because it didn't fit in their little cubicle. It didn't fit in their little, little thing. God needs to take us outside of the tent sometimes and show us the majesty of what he has created in our life. Folks, take the hood off the head and look at God. Again, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, tells us about Sarah. And it says this, which gives us the basis of our faith. You want to know what the basis of your faith is? Simple. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. That's the basis of your faith. I judge that God is faithful who promised. Doesn't look like he's faithful sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't sound like he's faithful. Sometimes it doesn't feel like he's faithful. But by faith, I step out of the tent. 
and I observe that which is God has made, and I observe that which is God has performed in my life. I observe the things he has done for me and the things he has done for you, and I come to understand that it is right and it is righteous for me to place my faith in him. Folks, it is logical to believe in God and to trust him. Be a man or woman of faith. Be like Abram or like Sarah and say, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father God, as we have gathered here today and we have sang songs of faith and sang songs of praise and brought honor and glory to your son, Father, it is beyond human reasoning, but we know that your Holy Spirit by faith is here among us. And we know, Father God, that he speaks to the hearts of men and women. And Father God, I know that everyone in this room has been given a measure of faith and that they can use that faith, Father God, to believe in you or to believe in something else. But I ask, Father God, that you take every individual here today, including myself, outside our tent. Show us the miraculous. Show us, Father God, that you love us and that you care and that your word is truth and that we can put our faith in you. And Father God, if there's someone here today that needs to make a decision that you would have them to make that does not seem to be logical in human nature, but, oh, Father God, makes perfect sense in your love and your grace and your faith. I ask, Father God, that you move them today. If there's someone here, Father, that needs to receive Jesus as their Savior, let them come forward. Take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want Jesus as my Savior. And, Father God, there might be those who need to join the church or those who need to be baptized or those who need to pray for someone. Let them come. Let them step out by faith do the impossible. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m., our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, Thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.